great job at that, um, waking you guys up for me. You know, I told the team this morning, let's just have fun. You know, we want church to be fun for people. It can also be serious, which we do that as well, and, and spiritual, and all, all those things are great, but let's add in a bit of a, a fun element. So the band did a great job. If you're not in here at 9 a.m., then that makes you two things. One, you're a regular South Pointer, because South Pointers show up 15 minutes late to, to most things. And two, you missed a, a really fun song that we did this morning. And we're going to start doing things uh, for those that come in on time, like we're going to hide money under the seats, and we're going to put chocolate places. So, hey, if you want to get that stuff, then... Uh, and you know what? The front rows have a greater potential for the greater reward. So if you move forward, then it increases your odds. Um, now, we, we, I just started gambling in church. Um, and we're not going to do that. So uh, I'm starting a, a series with you guys, and it's just this week and next week. And I, I had something really important on my heart. And that thing that God had been placing on my heart so much lately was, was I want to introduce you guys to Jesus more. I, I want us to be more aware of who he is and more aware of how our current situations align so much with what Jesus taught in the Bible or what we can learn about Jesus in the Bible. But also there's so many different things that we carry around during the week, so many different moods, attitudes, so many different things that we're up against at work or within our family. And we don't even know that Jesus is available to us or we don't know the facts of how Jesus has dealt with this before and that we have this avenue that we can go to that, that is Jesus. And so as I was planning for the series, I really liked this one, and it's called The Last Resort, The First Place to Go When Nothing Has Worked. Now, this isn't talking about your last vacation or your bailing out on, on Cape Town and getting up to the crew or getting somewhere for a resort because you're tired of the city, you're tired of traffic, so you get ready to go. This is talking more about your life. This is like, okay, I've tried everything that I can do, and now I'm kind of at my last resort. And what I hope that you get out of this message, I'll go ahead and, and tell you the, the end here in the beginning, is I hope that what you get out of this is that when you get to a place that, that you're just on your last resort, where you've tried everything and nothing is working anymore, I hope that when you leave today, you realize that actually there is one more thing that I can do. And Jesus is here for me to do that. See, I, I believe as somebody that has been through just an enormous amount of, of struggles and, and depression and anxiety and all kinds of different issues, you know, living overseas for 10 years without seeing family and all the, the things that come with that. And yeah, I feel like uh, the last, you know, there was a, a period in my life where every day was just a grind, like just grinding through the days. And I, and I remember there was a, a, a night, I'd been in South Africa, I was living in Nelspruit, and I'd been there for about 10, 11 months. And I'm sitting in my, my little house, I rented a, a, a little two-bedroom house on a, on a farm, and I'm sitting in there, and I just have this like breakdown moment, because I felt like, man, here I am 10 months into this thing, I thought that I would have friends, I thought that I would have a community, I thought that I would have like, I had greater expectations of where I thought that I would be. Little did I know that it was really hard for me as an American to fit in in, in Nelspruit. Great people, but boy, they made me work for it. They made me work. They made me work hard for it. But I got to a place where it just, I just felt like nothing was working. And, and I felt like that, that like, Lord, I, I don't know what else to do here. I don't know how to do this or what else to do. And I can't tell you that I had a moment where God said, oh, well, here, boom, and, and he opened up doors or he did something. It was just a grind. I just continued to kind of grind through day by day by day. And now here I stand. I mean, we've gone through incredible trials and, and things in our life that's been, you know, rough and hard, as everyone in this room has. But, but now I kind of stand on the other side of a truth, an acknowledged truth of how much Jesus is there for me and that it's okay for me to get to a last resort because Jesus is there for me. And so um, when we get to this place, you take your ticket, you take your ticket and you put on your backpack and you put your problems in your backpack, you put your depression back there, your kids that aren't living the way that, that you hoped that they would, uh, you put your financial problems, you put all your junk in the back of your backpack and you grab this ticket and you get on an airplane and typically, the first place that we go to, or when we launch off to our last resort, is this place called desperation. Now, desperation is an emotion and a feeling that we've all felt. And I thought, okay, let me, 
before we get into something super serious, let me break this. Let me, I want you guys to identify with desperation. Now, there's a lot of stories that I could tell here, and I did a lot, a lot, a lot of censoring before I came on stage this morning to make sure that I said the right thing. But I just, ha, have you guys ever, and this works for men, this also works for women, have you guys ever, like, been out on a date with somebody and you're sitting there at the dinner table and you know, you're all dressed up, you're looking nice, they're looking nice, you know, you're feeling each other, things are all good, you know, and, but you don't quite know each other super well, so you can't be like, you know, super open and, you know, honest with them. And you just, you, a little rumble in your tummy, you know, and you're like, and you got that rumble going and in your mind you're thinking, man, if I was at home, I would just let out a big fart, but... <laughs> I'm here in this restaurant with this significant other on the other side of the table, and I can't do that. You get through appetizers, you get through a little bit of wine, you get through dinner, and guess what's not gone anywhere? Is that, that tummy rumble. Now that thing is there. And so you're just trying, you say, okay, you know what, I'm going to push through this. You know, if we can put a man on the moon, I can hold it till I get home. But as the date goes on, that desperation builds, and it builds, and builds, and builds, and you finally, you know, you leave the restaurant, you know, you drop your date off, you know, and they're like, hey, you want to come in? No, no, don't, I'm okay, you know, respect to you, I'm going to go home, and you go home, and see, the, the moment of desperation, it's like as soon as your body knows that you're 300 meters from your front door, your life changes forever, all right? I don't know how it knows that. But it does. And you think you're walking all, you know, you're getting out of the car, you're walking all cool, you know, and you're out, I got this, I can make this, I can make this. But it's not that kind of walk. You guys all know the, you guys all know the walk, you know, where you're on your tiptoes, you know, and you're just trying to get in the door. That, that's desperation. That's, oh, Lord Jesus, let me just get in this house. Right? I mean, that, that, that we've all, I, I bet we've all been there. Some of you were there last night. You know, that's desperation, you know, in like a funny way, but, but it is, it's like, I would, I'd do anything in the world to get to where I need to be for this to be over. You know, I, I just, I will, I'm desperate for this situation not to play out the way that I'm afraid that it's going to play out. You know, that, that, that's a, a fun way to look at desperation, but then desperation, obviously the, it's, it's real and, and there are other things that we feel when we uh, feel desperate, there are other situations that inspire this desperation. And especially, like, desperation comes when you're at the end of yourself. So when you reach the end of who you are, desperation, that, that's when it comes. Josh, throw that slide on the screen so they can read that for them. Desperation comes when you're at the end of yourself. Now, I'll, I'll tell you another story. Casey and I were in Swaziland, and we were trying to... We'd gone into Swaziland for a vacation... And we were coming out, Leafa was in South Africa, our whole lives were in Nelspruit, and we were coming out of Swaziland, we were crossing the border, we'd gone in just fine, and on our way out, Casey's visa is confiscated. And the, the border patrol, you know, we were there for a long time, and I'm like, okay, something's not right here, because I've been in and out of that border a ton. And Casey's visa gets confiscated, and then they come to us, and they say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry, but her visa is actually fake, like the... Our visa is false. You know, it's not in the system. It's coming up as a stolen visa. And we just for so you guys don't know, we had not stolen a visa. We'd done everything. It was issued by Home Affairs and VFS. We'd gone to America on it, Lesotho on it. We got into Swaziland on it. No problems. And then we're getting ready to leave South Africa or leave Swaziland. And they say, no, you can't go. And I'm like, okay, what are our options? And he says, well, option one, I confiscate your uh, your visa or your, your passport and then you can go to Pretoria and file to have it shipped to Pretoria and this and that and I'm like well, that's never going to happen and he says option two I can give this back to you and pretend that you weren't in here you can go back into Swaziland and try something else and I said that's that's what we'll take and so we drove back into Swaziland backwards through the border which if you have ever been through borders that really confused everybody and so we just owned the situation and just hammered through and back in the country, and we decided we were going to try a different border post, a place called Belimbu, which is way, way, way up in the mountains. And so we drive and drive, and the whole way there, we are just at the end of ourselves. We're desperate. Like, we got to get back to our kids. I can't have, we can't get deported. We can't lose our passports. We can't lose all that stuff. And we were praying. We were calling people to pray. 
and we're dry, we're on like a two and a half hour drive to this border and it's up you know in the woods and there's a lot of gravel roads and I mean it is in the middle of nowhere and we get there and I'm just like nervous I'm just scared and God did this amazing miracle for us there were there were actually some dirt bikers that were climbing a hill and the border patrol the the, the guys at the border were more fixated on what they were doing up the mountains these guys were just like you know looking around and stamping a, you know they just stamped it and there you there you went you know and so we just passed through now little did we know that that would start the beginning of a like a seven-year journey of us fighting home affairs to get Casey's visa brought back into the right and so we were in a situation where we'd come to ourselves come to the end of ourselves that's where desperation really begins so in your finances, you, can, you, have, you have a plan. You have savings, you have investments, you have all that stuff. You have a bad month, you're like, okay, I can shift some things around. You have another bad month, okay, we can cut out Netflix and a few other things. You have another bad month, and it's like, okay, let's move some money out of savings. Another bad month, and it's like, you know, eventually the months are, are bad, and you get to a place, I just got no money left. And now I've actually come to the end of myself, and I'm feeling a lot of desperation. And, and the unique thing about desperation, and I want you to identify with this completely, is that desperation is relative. So desperation is relative to you. It, it's relative to you in that what makes you feel desperate, Josh, throw that slide up for them there. What makes you feel desperate doesn't necessarily make another person feel desperate. So you may feel desperate about your finances, but someone else that has no money and never had any money doesn't feel desperate desperate about their finances when they have no money. You may feel like you hit a place of desperation when you're dealing with legal fees, but then somebody else doesn't feel that. You know, I'll say now we've got, I think Brooke and Nick are over here on the side, and they're working through some, right, are you guys over here? Okay, okay just checking for the light. That young couple just got married, I mean, amazing, and uh, they're working through Brooke's visa stuff, and and they're like, oh, well, you know, we got this, fingerprints got rejected, da 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 and Casey and I are like, well, what's the problem, you know? We lived here illegally for 10 years, like, you guys are fine, you know? It's very desperate to them, it's no longer desperate to us. So desperation is relative, that's important. So whatever you feel in your life, okay, that there's something that makes you feel desperate. And it's, it's okay for it to be different for you than it is for somebody else. And what I don't want to do is I don't want you to minimize yourself because somebody else has it worse. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, this is a desperate situation for me. You know, I'm in complete desperation because I live in a five-bedroom house and I've got a two-car garage and I've got, you know, three cars parked outside and two parked inside. But you know what? Uh, we don't have hot water upstairs for two hours and you feel, a you know, if that's you, if that's your most desperate moment, then great. Own that moment. I'm not, don't take that away from yourself. Because see, what desperation reveals in us, because it's relative, is your level of desperation is based on the value that you place on what you desire. So I'll, I'll say that for you one more time. Your, your level, Josh is going to throw it up here on the screen. Your level of desperation is based on the value you place on what you desire most. So how much value you place on your desires has the greatest potential for you to come to the end of yourself and desperation to set in. So then I ask you, okay, what, what do you value? What do you value most? You know, growing up, my father... Um, he grew up extremely poor, and I, and I know that there's like kind of the stigma around, well, there's like third world country poor, and then there's America poor, and those are two different things, but, but my dad grew up in a, like a one-bedroom house through the Great Depression, and he grew up extremely poor, and they didn't always have, you know, food on the table, didn't know where it was going to come from, didn't have a lot of money, he couldn't go, he didn't go to college because of that, instead he found out he could make more money playing pool as like a pool shark, and my dad was was never they, they never had enough they always had just enough but they never had enough to leave that sort of panic of being poor and so now my dad's greatest value growing up was that he would give my brother and I and my mom a wonderful life that he would be able to send us to college that he would be able to to take care of us and they would continue to be able to help, help take care of us you know 
So they, they love that. But as soon as the market falls or something happens, guess what? Good old Gary Ladd gets a little bit stressed and a little bit desperate. Now, his value is not money. His value is his, is his family. But he doesn't want to see his family go through what he had to go through. So what is it that you value? What is it that you value or that you desire the most? I want you to, to think about that. I want you to hold that in your head because you've got to connect with this. If you don't connect with this message, then it's just words. It goes in one ear, it goes out the other ear. I want you to connect. So I want you to think about, in my life, of all the things that I value, if one of them disappeared or was threatened or taken away, what, what is that value that would drive me to the most desperation in my life? I want you to take that and hold on to it as we go through the rest of this message. Now, this is not something that, desperation is not something that's new to us. It's, it's not. It's not something that um, just came about when social media came out. It's not something that came with the invention of money. This thing is like as old as time. This is ever since there's been humans on earth, there's been desperation. So we're not alone. There's people that have been through it before. There's people that have been through it before those people and people that have been through it before those people. And we're going to look at this telling in Mark today. And this is a, a, a passage that's really great because there's like a miracle and then inside the miracle there's a miracle. You guys know those Russian dolls where you have the doll and inside the doll, inside the doll? Well, that's kind of what this is like today. It's like we're going to hear about Jesus performing a miracle, but then inside that miracle, he's going to perform another miracle. And both of them, guess what? They're tied to desperation. They're slightly different, but they're tied to these people that feel like they've come to the end of themselves. They are at their last resort. They don't know what else to do. And so what do they do in their desperation? Well, they have an encounter with Jesus. This is what I said in the beginning. I want you to encounter Jesus because I want you to know how Jesus can meet you in this moment in your life, in your desperation. It's not enough for me to just tell you Jesus loves you, everything is fine. Go on out there and live your day and everything's going to be wonderful. It's like I want you to think about the thing that hurts you, that makes you feel desperate. Think about the thing, the part of Jesus that you don't know. So I would like to say that, hey, if, if you're new here, you don't know Jesus at all, like just so that you know there's parts of you, there's parts of your feelings, parts of, of what makes you who you are, what you think about during the day, what you stress about, what you're excited about, what you're good at, what you're not good at. There are parts of Jesus that fit all of those things. And they're wonderful parts of Jesus. And so we get to look at how Jesus fills a hole of desperation. So this message is for the person that has a moment of desperation in their life, maybe right now, maybe in the past, but definitely it's going to happen in the future. That's what this message is for. And if it doesn't hit you now, then I hope it just plants in your little brain and your heart like seeds. And when it's ready, when you're ready for it, when you need it, I hope it just sprouts for you. So let's, let's turn to our stories. We look at Mark here. And I, I just, I love the Bible. I, I love teaching out of the Bible. It's so much fun. Um, I never, I didn't go to Bible college. I just, I'm a student of it. I love it. And I love what we can learn from it. And so uh, I'm one of the weird people that, that, that read and teach out of this version called the Amplified Bible. So if you're new here and your Bible doesn't have these brackets in it, I just want you to know what that is. That's the NASB version, which is the most word-to-word -word translated version. And what the Amplified Bible does is it gives context to the words. So when you see those brackets, that's what it's doing. So we go to Mark 5, 21 through 24. Jesus has just been on like this healing tour. He just threw, did you know that there was a time when Jesus cast a bunch of demons out and the demons asked Jesus if they could be put into a herd of pigs. And Jesus says, sure, you guys can go over there. And they jumped into these pigs and then the pigs ran off the cliff and they died. And then the town came down and even though somebody was healed and wasn't possessed or, or dealing with demons anymore, they were mad because all the pigs were dead. And so they had to chase Jesus out of town. And that's just what happened to Jesus. All the pigs are dead. He's chased out of town. He actually passes through the crowd. And so now Jesus, he crosses over. He leaves the Gentile side. So that, that the Gentiles were the people that were non-Jewish people, meaning they were all doomed to go to hell and the, the Jewish people didn't believe that they could have access to God. And, and Jesus has left their side and now he's come back over to the Jewish side. And in the Jewish side here, that, that's what he says. When Jesus had crossed over in the boat to the other side of the sea, 
the Jewish side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. Now I want to tell you a few things before we move on here. One, Jesus stayed by the seashore. My theory on that is, you know, crowd management and acoustics. I mean, Jesus was known for standing in a boat, elevating himself, and, you know, and talking to people. And so he stays by the seashore. But then this part here, a synagogue official. This is kind of like the equivalent to a pastor. This is somebody in the synagogue, which is the temple, or, the, or you, you know, we could even say maybe the church. And what their job was is they were to run the business side of it, and then they were also to run like the services of it and the programming. So this synagogue official, and usually they were Pharisees, this is somebody that's running, running the synagogue. So this is actually the last person that should be coming to Jesus. It's absolutely the last person. Because up until now, Jesus has completely defied all the Old Testament laws. All of them. Well, the ones that they created. The ones that Jesus and God created together. He's not broken those. But the ones, the 457, I think it is, extra laws that the Pharisees added on. Jesus keeps violating those things left and right. We talked about that last week when he violated it just by picking wheat. And so you have Jesus intersecting with a synagogue official. This should never happen. I can't explain to you more as to why this should never happen, but it should never, ever, ever happen. And this guy's name is Jairus. And he comes up to Jesus, runs up to Jesus, and he falls at his feet. So if you're an official of a synagogue, and Jesus is your number one enemy... What could possibly drive you to fall and bow at the feet of Jesus? Desperation. This guy tried everything. He probably burned sacrifices. He probably gave more money to the temple. He probably did everything that he knew that he could do, that the Old Testament law said to do. And his daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, is still sick. So he hears about this guy named Jesus. He hears about what's going on. And even though he knows this is the last person that he should turn to, he knows that he's at his last resort. And so it's desperation that drives him to fall on his feet. And so then after he falls on his feet, the text goes on to tell us that that he he falls on his feet and he begged anxiously with him. He's He's begged anxiously. He's anxious about it. And he's saying, my little daughter, who we'll find out next week, because we're going to talk about him next week, is 12, who's 12 years old. My little daughter is at the point of death. Please, come lay your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. See, he's asking something that's, that's maybe, there's no rule or law that says Jesus has to lay hands on somebody. I think he's maybe reacting out of superstition or, or out of a lack of understanding as to how Jesus does the stuff that he does. You know, he's like, okay, I've seen you heard about you I don't know what you need to do do you need to like do you do this and then lay hands you know clear or do you you know what is it I don't know how you do it but can you just come and lay hands on my on my daughter and and heal her and so Jesus says okay and Jesus went with him says all right let's go now in Luke we there's a story of a Roman centurion soldier which is like okay you've got Jesus you have the, the synagogue and the Jewish people that hate Jesus. And then you have the Romans that control the area. They don't really like the Jewish people. The Jewish people hate the Romans. And then the Romans, I mean, they could care less about who Jesus is. And so you've got all these tears of, like, hate and disrespect and, and all that stuff. And in Luke, a Roman centurion, a soldier, actually comes to Jesus and says that one of his kids is sick. And Jesus says, all right, cool, they're healed. It's your faith that heals them. And they're healed. Jesus didn't have to go lay hands on them or anything like that. He just said it's healed. Jesus could have done this here, but because he's God and he knows everything, he knew what was going to happen next. And so Jesus goes with him. And as he went with him, a large crowd followed him and pressed in around him from all sides. So think about standing at the ATM line on payday. There's just people all over the place. They're pressing on Jesus' side. And so... Let's look at, at who Jarius is. Jarius is a guy that represents those of us that stand in the gap for one another. See, his desperation wasn't for himself. His desperation was for his daughter. Jarius was coming to Jesus because he was standing in the gap for his daughter. 
So some of you, I want you to, to, to know and connect with this, that, that your desperation isn't for you, but you're standing in the gap for somebody else. And Jesus hears that. Jesus, he feels compassion for that. Your desperation doesn't have to be about you. It can be for somebody else. And Jesus has this amazing heart for that. There is an incredible opportunity and blessing when you can stand in the gap for somebody else. When you come to your last resort, those of you that are caretakers, those of you that have uh, sickness in your families, those of you that have you know, family members that are kind of wayward or they're off doing other things, wh whatever it is, is there a gap that you can stand in that you can bring desperation to Jesus that would move him to come with you to heal that person? So Jarius represents that. He represents those of us who stand in the gap for others. Now, this is the part that's quite interesting, the Russian doll part. While Jesus is walking to go to Jairus' house, I mean, it's quite literally, they're walking down the road, they've got a large crowd that's gathered around them, and there's people that are pressing in on him, there's people that, you know, like all over the place, and Jesus has got his disciples with him. I, I want you to picture, you know, the, the landscape of all these people trying to get to Jesus. And he's walking, and he's got Jairus with him, and they're walking, they're talking, being pressed in, tons of people around. In the middle of this moment, something incredible happens. There's a woman, and this woman comes up. And let's look at what she does. So it continues here in the scripture in, in verse 25. So there's a woman in the crowd who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years. And she had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had not been helped at all. She'd had and was not, she, she had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. So before we go on, let me talk about this wonderful lady. Jairus was identified as a synagogue leader. This woman isn't identified by who she is. She's identified by the affliction that she has. This woman is identified as the woman that is hemorrhaging, which means that she's bleeding. Now, what this means for her, uh, in, in like the simple truth of it is, is she's considered unclean. So if you're considered unclean, you can't go to the temple. You can't worship, meaning you don't have access to God. You don't have forgiveness. There's no way that you can do anything to, to atone for your sins. You're just left out to die. She has no family. She has no husband. If this had happened while she was married, her husband would have divorced her and left her, and she would be left with absolutely nothing. And even more so, anything that she touched became unclean. So she wasn't even culturally allowed to touch somebody. Because if she touched you, you would become unclean. Meaning you then wouldn't be able to go to worship or go to the temple. You would then have to go through a ceremony of cleansing yourself and a time period of cleansing yourself in order for you to be made clean again. See, if, if I were this woman and I was aggravated, I'd run around like, like Benjamin, our three-year-old does, and just touch everything. You know, we're trying to teach him not to touch the walls when he walks by. His hands are dirty. We're like, hey, Benjamin, don't touch the walls until you wash your hands. And as soon as you say those words, he's like, okay. You know, I don't understand why I can't just touch everything. You want me to wash the hands? All right. And he just walks through the house and touches everything. And that, that's, that's what I would do if I was this woman. Spite. That's not a, a Christian value. Don't do that. <laughs> so this woman is, is that, 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 that's who she is. She's identified as her affliction. And then she hears reports about Jesus. See, G, the, the reports, what people are saying about Jesus are causing people who would not normally go to Jesus to come to Jesus. That's what happened with Jairus, and that's what happens now with her. She heard reports about Jesus. She came up from behind him in the crowd. So guess what? She's sneaking. She's probably covered up because as Jesus is being pressed by the crowd, guess who's part of that pressing? An unclean woman. And if everyone knew that an unclean woman was in that crowd touching other people, then she may be stoned. She may be, who knows? It would be really bad. And then all the people that she touched in that crowd would be considered unclean. And she knows this. Her life is on the line with this, probably. And so she probably covers up. She probably does everything she can to hide and make sure that nobody can see her. And that's why she comes up behind Jesus. 
Because everybody's looking at the face of Jesus, trying to get in front of him, trying to talk to him, trying to see him. And she comes up behind, and she touches out a robe. See, a, a, a teacher, a rabbi, would have worn two or three layers. And the outer layer that they would have worn was, was their, their outer coat. And it had tassels on the ends of it. And so she would have come up and she would have maybe grabbed that tassel or touched that coat. And what happened is that coat, that corner, that piece of fabric became a contact point for her desperation and her faith to have an encounter with Jesus. So she thought, if I just touch his clothing, then I'll get well. That's a desperate person. See, desperation drove her here. And then the story goes on, and it tells us in the next verse, in, in verse 29, and it says, Josh is going to put it on the screen for us here. 29, it says, Immediately, her flow of blood was dried up. She felt it in her body, and she knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. And then immediately, Jesus, recognizing in himself that the power had gone out of him, he turned around in the crowd, and he asked, Who touched my clothes? See, what's amazing here is that she felt it and Jesus felt it. That was a real thing. This is the moment where she's healed. She's immediately healed. See, it's like, you know, the, the disciples, their mind is going to be boggled. And we're going to read that here in just a second. But, but she felt the healing. And then Jesus felt the power come out of him. He felt that he healed her just when he touched her clothing. Now, that, that to me is kind of crazy because... Jesus is in a crowd with a whole bunch of people, but he says, who touched my clothes? He turns around in the crowd, turns around because he knows it's behind him. He turns around in the crowd and he says, who touched my clothes? He knew who touched her clothes, but he's got, he's got a plan for this. So he's asked this question, who touched my clothes? And then his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in all around you from all sides. And you asked, who touched me? They're like, Jesus, come on, man. Get a grip. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Everybody's touching you. Everybody's touching all of us. Nobody, remember, this is pre-deodorant. This is pre, this is pre, you know, all that stuff. You got everybody, you know, sweating in a small space, touching each other. And the disciples are like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Everybody. Everybody's touching everybody. And still, he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. Because he knew who had done it, and he looks for her, and he finds her. And then it tells us in verse 33, And the woman, she's now been identified by Jesus. Though she was afraid and trembling. See, she'd already been healed. Jesus had already healed her. Why is she afraid and why is she trembling? And also, why is Jesus calling her out in public? There's a huge crowd, remember? A huge crowd that would kill her for making everyone unclean. And Jesus, in public, stops the whole mess. And he says, who touched me? There you are. Woman, you come here. You're the one that touched me. All eyes on them. Just looking and listening to her and Jesus. Realizing that maybe she was unclean and she had touched everybody. So now it's tense. There's a lot of tenseness going on in this. And so she's afraid and trembling. And she's aware of what had happened to her and came and she fell down before him and she told him the old, she told him the whole truth. So she just spills our beans. Jesus, sorry, you know, I was, I was unclean. I've been hemorrhaging for 12 years. I don't have anything. I, I'm an unclean person. I'm not allowed in here. I'm not allowed to do any of this stuff. And she just spills her guts on who she is and, and, and everything that's happened to her in her life. And, and she says, I just thought that if I could touch the corner of your robe that, that I would maybe be healed. And, and she just dumps it all out. It's like tipping over a bucket of water, just dumps it all out for Jesus. And everyone else hears this as well. And see, I think that the reason that Jesus called her and brought her out into the public like this is because he knew that he healed her. She knew that she was healed, but Jesus wanted to make sure that everyone in the crowd knew that she was healed. And so in front of everyone in the crowd, I mean, this is, this, this is the same Jesus that loves you today. This is not Bible Jesus, and then, we, and then today we have like 2020 TikTok Jesus. This is, the same, this is the same dude. It's the same Jesus. 
We have access to the same Jesus that walked the streets. Actually, we have more access to him. We don't have to run him down and touch his robe. All we have to do is, is talk to him and pray. And Jesus, after he hears the whole truth of this woman's life, he says something so wonderful to her. See, he changes her name. She's no longer a woman. Now she's daughter. She's no longer identified by her affliction. Now she's identified by her position. So she is now a daughter of Christ. Her affliction is gone. See, Jairus, as we're going to learn next week, he never, he never becomes part of a position of Jesus. You know, something amazing happens in that story, but she just had the sweet, sweet thing happen in her life where she went from an unclean woman to the daughter of Christ. And he says, your faith, which is your personal trust and confidence in me, has restored you to health. Go in peace. So he speaks against the anxiousness that she had. Don't be anxious. Don't be trembling. Now you go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. Meaning, don't you worry. This is not, this isn't cancer in remission. You don't have to spend the rest of your life wondering if this is going to come back. You're permanently healed. See, this is what I hope that you guys understand. I hope that you guys understand that in your life that there are desperate moments and desperate times. Sometimes you're standing in the gap for somebody. And that's a desperation that you take to Jesus and Jesus will go with you. But sometimes you're the unclean, messed up, uh, unaccepted person. You feel like you're cast out. You're on the outside of society. Even if in the public, you've, everyone thinks that you're in and you're all good. And, hey, man, I saw you at church. Or, hey, man, we're, we're friends at work. We're mates. Let's go have a, a drink. And everything's happy and good. And then you go home and, and the door closes. And turns out you're not good. You're not happy. You're suffering from addiction. Or you're suffering from an affliction. You're suffering from a pain that has made you unclean. You know, if you, if you carry scars, especially emotional scars, that'll make you unclean. Because then when you go out, you take that hate and that, that hatred and that hurt that you feel and you just apply it to other people. That's like, you now you're making them unclean. You guys ever, ever work with somebody and they walk in the office and they just bring the mood way down? You know, that's somebody that's, that's making you, that's make, their uncleanness is making you unclean. We don't have to be unclean people. So we can take all the stuff that we carry and that we have in our heart and we can go to Jesus and we can touch his robe. Only it's so easy for us to do that. All we have to do is, is pray and talk to him. And see, a beautiful thing about these two stories is one of the common things that they have that they share with each other is that desperation leads to faith. See, they, they were in a lot of, of desperate um, emotions and, and their situations were completely desperate. But their desperation leads them to their faith. See, it's faith that healed the woman. Jesus said it. It's by your faith that you're healed, not your desperation that that healed you. It's your faith. But sometimes we just need that desperation to push us into a position of faith. So if you're feeling desperate, if, you, if you've got that area in your life, remember I asked you to think about it. Is there an area in your life where you feel desperate, where you feel desperation coming? This is that area for you to think, hey, could this be pushing me to take a step of faith, to stand in the gap for someone else or to bring my unclean heart to Jesus? See, it's, it's what they heard about Jesus that sparked faith in the midst of their desperation. What, what they heard about Jesus is what sparked that faith in the midst of their desperation. They heard that Jesus was coming to town. They heard that Jesus was on his way. And it sparked in them this faith that then led them to take actions and to make decisions Josh, throw that slide up for everybody to see there. I want to make sure that you get this. See, the reason I use the TV for you guys is some of you are audible learners and some of you are visual learners. And those of you that are visual, I don't want you to miss out on this. When they heard about Jesus, it sparked faith in the midst of their desperation. So let me tell you something. If you're in the midst of desperation, I'm here telling you about Jesus. So this is your opportunity to respond just like they responded 
and let desperation take you to a place of faith and take you to an encounter with Him. So let me ask you this question. When was the last time that hearing about Jesus increased your faith? See, that, that, that can be a, a hard question to, to answer. When was the last time that hearing about Jesus increased your faith? Think about that. And better yet, think about this question. When was the last time that you told somebody about Jesus and that it increased their faith? See, we have this, this opportunity here in the church where I can tell you about Jesus so you can increase your faith, you can respond in your desperation, but also I look out here and I see, you know, 160 people or so, and I think, hey, there's, there's like 100 opportunities in this room right here for you to go tell somebody about Jesus and let it increase their faith. See, we have a role to play here. It doesn't all sit on my shoulders and the band's shoulders. Actually, it's, it's on all of us. Think about the opportunity that we have to share Jesus that would increase somebody else's faith. I mean, that's an incredible opportunity. And so, you know, before we close here and, and the band leads us in another song, I, you know, I just want to encourage you, if you let your desperation bring you to Jesus, just imagine what he would do for you. If you let your desperation bring you to Jesus, just imagine what it is that he could do for you. Whether you're standing in the gap for somebody or whether you're bringing your unclean heart to Jesus, just imagine what he would do for you. Because I can't show you a place in the Bible where Jesus kicks dirt on somebody and says, nah, get out of here. Jesus always responds and he'll respond to you. And so we're going to sing one more worship song. And while we sing, as always, we'll have our prayer partners that will come to the front here. And if you feel in your heart I mean, you can get prayer for anything that you need. You can come forward in prayer. But if you feel in your heart that you're standing in the gap for somebody or you've got something unclean in you, bitterness, anger, jealousy, hurt, whatever you're carrying in you that's making you unclean, that's spreading and making other people feel unclean, you can bring that down and you can just confess it. Say, hey, here's what's going on in my life, and our prayer team will just pray for you. We're not here to solve your problems. We're here to stand with you in the middle of those problems and encourage you through them. And so, Lord, 